deals with the different circumstances that brought them to be there at that bridge. These people who didn't even know each other brought them to be there at that bridge that day. And the question of a chaotic universe in which random events occur versus the concept of a deterministic universe in which an ordered destiny or fate is at work is one of the questions that's raised by these type of, of things. Uh, viewed from the perspective of a random chance universe, what are the odds that a young woman who left Paris, Texas to move to Anchorage, Alaska would happen to stop at that precise location, Liard Hot Springs, at that particular time of day to become the victim of a bear attack? Questions arise along the lines of what if she had come to the park an hour earlier and left an hour earlier? Uh, you know, what if they'd arrived there the day before? Then would she have avoided what happened? In a Probably. meaningless, yeah, in a meaningless universe, what happened to her was random and without rhyme or reason. Now, viewed from a perspective of destiny, a deterministic universe, other elements come into play. Uh, there's the question of do people realize when their time is near? Patty had remarked several times to friends and family, "I will never live to see 40." Well, she was 37 when the bear attack occurred. She had remarked just before leaving Paris, I want to get away from it all and start a new life. And there's a very strange, uh, which her, her daughter, Kristen, who's, who's now an adult, uh, wrote about in a, a topics forum thread. Apparently, and this was just joking, of course, when they were leaving Paris, at the very beginning of their trip, they stopped uh, at a guy's house. And Patty jokingly said, you know, when I get back up there to Alaska, I'm going to feed the bears. And the guy looked there and he said, girl, those bears will eat you up. And he was just joking, just making an offhanded remark. But it takes on a, a, a cryptic, uh, predictive type element when, when, you, when you view what happened. You know, in light of what happened, uh, a, a lot of different things take on a different meaning, you know, depending on one's point of view. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we ask ourselves that all the time, you know, in day-to-day -day living, you know. It's like, oh, darn, you know, maybe this wouldn't have happened if I had done that. Or, you know, that person would still be alive if, you know, I had done something different. And, you know, it is, yeah. it's mind-boggling to think about. Absolutely it is. And there seems to be some indication that some people have some sort of an awareness subconsciously uh, if their death is imminent. Uh, it could be that some people have a subconscious awareness when their time is near. Those those are deep questions that mankind has wrestled with for ages. I guess since the dawn of mankind, these are questions that. Uh, and as as uh, one of our occasional guests here on the show, uh, psychologist uh, and the uh, founder of the Birth Order Group, Henry Baxley. He says he believes these questions are unanswerable. He thinks that certain questions are simply unanswerable. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting comment. Uh, On August the 14th, 1997, a black bear attacked and killed a woman from Paris, Texas and a Canadian man who tried to save her. Two other people were severely mauled and hospitalized. This event is statistically more rare than being struck by lightning or winning the lottery. Discussing tonight. Her soul consciousness may have had enough power to say, okay, this reality is a bunch of blase nonsense. We're going to go on to something else right now. No, it's just like dying or passing, which I love that word too. All right. I know it's going to be different than everybody else's death. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I know what it is, it's just for me. Some people can experience their own death in the here and now because they can consciously walk into at any time they want to another reality. You know, it's another reality. One year before the murder suicide. That was Michael's voice uh, at the group. And he was talking about uh, the way I look at it. If it was tomorrow, I'd go to sleep, I'd be ready. My death is going to be different to everybody else's death. 
some people can experience their own death in the here and now. It was about 4.30 on the afternoon of Tuesday, September 8, 1981. The two children, boys 11 and 6 years old, walked home from school after getting off the school bus and seeing their mother's car was back in the driveway. Catherine had been gone to Kentucky for five weeks and had arrived back Monday, September the 7th, Labor Day night. Michael had already gotten home from Dallas on Friday. When the children came in and discovered the horrifying scene, they immediately called their grandmother, Catherine's mother. The scene was shocking. Catherine was on the bed, two 22 caliber rifle shots to her head. Seated next to the bed, leaning against the dresser, was the body of Michael, who had apparently committed suicide by shooting himself in the head after killing Catherine. In the kitchen, a strange occult symbol was done on the tabletop. Michael had drawn a pyramid with an eye hovering over it, with a man and woman holding hands, walking down a pathway toward a dark door in the front of the pyramid. Below the pyramid were written these words, life, death, and dying. A number of occult and mystical books from Michael's mass library of esoteric literature was nearby. That's the scene. And we have a caller, I see, from Illinois. Good evening. Hi, Rich. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, when and how did Michael and Catherine meet? They met uh, in Dallas, in the Metroplex, whenever they were working together at uh, Level or Blinds. And they uh, developed a relationship at that time uh, in the late 70s and uh, began living together. Uh, one apartment after another, they, they were in more than one place. And then they ended up coming to the, uh, moving out into the country uh, where the incident, the murder-suicide occurred. Uh, they had moved out there by early 1980, and the event itself happened in September of 81. I see. Did, were they? knew himself. He knew he was out of control. He knew who he had signed with. He knew the gang world he was wrapped up in, and um, he had already been shot one time and almost murdered. And so he, yeah, he he knew what he was in, and he knew it wasn't going to end well. Well, Jake, can you tell us what happened the night Tupac was killed? Um, the night Tupac was killed, he went to um, he went to Las Vegas to see uh, his friend Mike Tyson fight. Um, had a heavyweight title fight and. Um, he went with his crew, with um, Suge Knight and other Blood Gang members, he, and uh, they watched the fight. Uh, everyone was in a good mood. Um, when when uh, Tupac was leaving the fight, he uh, was interviewed by a cameraman, and then when he was leaving, um, his crew spotted a Crip member in the MGM lobby. And they this Crip member had stolen a death row uh, golden-plated necklace um, off of the member of uh, off of a blood member. So they whispered in Tupac's ear, "Hey, um, that Crip member over there, he's he's the one that stole our medallion." Tupac, trying to be the hero, ran over, uh, punched this Crip member in the lobby, and all of the crew started jumping on. Uh, this guy, his name was Orlando Anderson. They started jumping him, kicking him, punching him. Then they get up and they leave. Tupac and all of them run out of the casino. Um, the police question Orlando Anderson in classic street code. He doesn't cooperate. He doesn't want to press charges. And Tupac goes back to his hotel room and tells his girlfriend um, she better stay in the hotel. So they get in their car in a black uh, BMW. And uh, and they're riding down the road and um, down the strip in Las Vegas. Um, they're going to a club named 662 where um, Tupac's supposed to uh, perform. Suge Knight's driving the car. Tupac's 
in the passenger seat. There's a lot of security behind Tupac following him. And uh, around this time, or a little bit before it, based on um, the Compton uh, police I've talked to who dealt with the case, they said that Orlando Anderson, when Tupac went and punched him, um, Tupac signed his death certificate because um, you don't do that in their world. And Tupac was out of control, and he bit off more than he could chew. And it's very sad. And so they went back and decided, uh, the Crips decided that they didn't care if it was Tupac. Um, he had disrespected him. He had punched him out in the open in front of everybody. And there were, you know, and, and as far as their eyes were considered, they don't see Tupac. They have no regard for human life. And they uh, saw him as a blood member. And so he was driving down the road. They're bumping their music. They get pulled over because their music's too loud, Chug and Tupac. And they don't have license plates and all that. They're let go. They continue down the road. They're laughing. They pull up to a stoplight. And um, a white Cadillac uh, pulls up beside them. And um, a gunman, there's four men. Um, in the Cadillac, and a gunman pulls a Glock out of the, puts his arm out of the back seat and shoots, uh, I believe, 13 rounds into Tupac's door. And um, I think Tupac was hit a, n a number of times, and um, one of the bullets ripped through him and uh, went into his chest, and um, the Cadillac drove off, you know, and that was that. And so the night. Tupac, uh, Suge Knight is uh, shocked. He's been hit in the head by a fragment. He's bleeding out of his head, too. Tupac is shot um, a bunch of times because he tried to climb in the back seat during the shooting, which exposed him to more shots. And they turn the car around in the middle of the road. They drive down. Uh, the police catch up to him. Las Vegas police are on their bicycles. And they um, pull Tupac out of the car. And, um, you know, Tupac's laying there trying to breathe, saying he can't breathe. Um, and the police are looking at, you know, one police is holding him, and he's one police is trying to get him to tell him who shot him. You know, Tupac saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I can't breathe. The last thing he ever said uh, was he looked at a cop, and the cop said, tell me who shot you. And he looked at the cop and um, said, told the cop, uh, F you to the cop. Yeah. event which we will be discussing tonight. Her sole consciousness may have had enough power to say, okay, this reality is a bunch of blase nonsense. We're going to go on to something else right now. No, it's just like dying or passing, which I love that word too. All right. I know it's mm -hmm. going to be different than everybody else's death. Mm -hmm. Whether or not I know what it is. It's just for me. Some people can experience their own death in the here and now because they can consciously walk into at any time they want to another reality. In other words, it's another reality. One year before the murder-suicide, that was Michael Boyce uh, at the group. And he was talking about uh, the way I look at it, if it was tomorrow, I'd go to sleep, I'd be ready. My death is going to be different to everybody else's death. Some people can experience their own death in the here and now. It was about 4.30 on the afternoon of Tuesday, September 8, 1981. The two children, boys 11 and 6 years old, walked home from school after getting off the school bus and seeing their mother's car was back in the driveway. Catherine had been gone to Kentucky for five weeks and had arrived back Monday, September the 7th, Labor Day night. Michael had already gotten home from Dallas on Friday. When the children came in and discovered the horrifying scene, they immediately called their grandmother, Catherine's mother. The scene was shocking. Catherine was on the bed two 22 caliber rifle shots to her head. Seated next to the bed, leaning against the dresser, was the body of Michael 
who had apparently committed suicide by shooting himself in the head after killing Catherine. In the kitchen, a strange occult symbol was done on the tabletop. Michael had drawn a pyramid with an eye hovering over it, with a man and woman holding hands, walking down a pathway toward a dark door in the front of the pyramid. Below the pyramid were written these words, life, death, and dying. A number of occult and mystical books from Michael's mass library of esoteric literature was nearby. That's the scene. And we have a caller, I see, from Illinois. Good evening. Hi, Rich. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, when and how did Michael and Catherine meet? They met uh, in Dallas, in the Metroplex, whenever they were working together at uh, Level or Blinds. And they uh, developed a relationship at that time uh, in the late 70s and uh, began living together. Uh, one apartment after another, they, they were in more than one place. And then they ended up coming to the, uh, moving out into the country uh, where the incident, the murder-suicide occurred. Uh, they had moved out there by early 1980, and the event itself happened in September of 81. I see. Did, did, were they... I have no doubt it's because of what happened that day. Well, Becky, we have a caller from uh, Central Illinois. Well, hello. Good evening. Hi, it's Terry. Hi, Terry. How are you this evening? Fine. Uh, I, w I was just uh, curious. Uh, exactly, do they know exactly how many people died? Or because there were so many people, were they so many uncounted for? Um, on July 31st of 1890, which is just a little over one year after the flood, the Johnstown Tribune released a, vi uh, a um, flood victim list, and that has been held as the official victim list for the last 125 years. My book um, changes that number, and I can honestly say I don't know the exact number yet because since I've announced the release of this book, I've been getting emails, messages, phone calls, um, people wanting me to include their family member that was either wrongfully identified or not identified. So that number, the number I, even I have is going to change. And I, I don't know what the exact one is going to end up to. There is also a bunch of people who weren't identified, um, parts of bodies, um, people who were identified by how much they weigh, the, the jewelry on their body. Um, all of that will be included in my book so that you will get a fuller picture of the enormity of the catastrophe. You know, it's going to be listed, not just the official list that stands now, excuse me, is just a bunch of names, names, ages, where, you know, what part of town they lived in, where they were buried. To me, that's just a name. As I've been researching, I've been discovering stories. These people, they're, they're not just a name, they're, they're lives, they're families. They're just like you and I, sitting down to to eat or they, the what the flood water was in the city so it and they were trying to move their furniture up but imagine someone's carrying furniture up the stairs and then the flood just takes them or you're in an attic trying to, to get away and you have to put your children one by one on debris as it floats by to try to save their lives it is so hard for me to wrap my head around I know. It's just, enormous it's horrendous. Oh, horrendous. She, uh, the, a mom placed each child on a piece of debris and, and told them goodbye and say God would watch over them. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, it, they didn't have any other choice. No, they didn't. They really didn't. Uh, I have literally sat and cried reading these because um, the more I research into the list, it's it's no, it's not even just a list anymore. These are people to me. Just you know, there are lives. I had one man send his his family genealogy to me, and I was staring at the faces I had typed over, the names I had typed over and over again, and these weren't just names anymore. They were faces, and, and they lived in this house, and they went to this school, and these were their friends, and this is who they married, and oh, my. <laughs> and I think 
I think there's been kind of like a, a cloud of gloom over Johnstown for a very, very long time. And I really feel that it's the souls of these people who haven't been identified or were identified wrongly. And I think, I think they just want to be identified as I was there and I died and I want someone to know that I died. Yes, you know, to I, remember them. Yes. In fact, I, I really...